All right, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be in Lumini. Um, I'm going to talk about a uh, result that I, well, half result basically, or a, a piece of a result that I presented many times, but I think it goes in the right direction. So I apologize to all of you that already heard it, and I'm not going to add a, a lot in the talk. There, there, are, there is progress, but it's not finished yet. So, uh, so let me try to present the problem and also the, uh, the, the, the ideology, the idea of uh, how to attack it. And then also I will state uh, the main result, which is a criterion for the ergodicity of, uh, of uh, geodesic flows on flat surfaces and which I hope will, will uh, uh, eventually give, uh, give a result about the ergodicity of billiards in non-rational polygons. So the problem is the following. So we have a polygon P, and we will take a polygon with uh, no rash, at least one non-rational angle, so no ra let's say non-rational angles. And we look at, so this is our polygon. We look at the billiard flow. And uh, the billiard flow uh, takes place in the phase space. So let's say that it takes place in a table cross S1 because we need a unit tangent vector. Well, uh, a, a step that we take immediately is to, turn, to, turn, to eliminate the boundary from the picture and take a double. So if you take a double, then we, have a, uh, we take two, two copies of, of P and we glue along the, edge, uh, along the edges and we find a flat sphere. We find a, a flat sphere that I will call S, uh, mostly. And I will call M the unit tangent bundle of the flat sphere. And this is our phase space. And what we are really studying is the geodesic flow on this, on this, on this M. So very good. So uh, this is not, clearly is not a translation surface, uh, because I'm assuming no rational angle, so uh, there will be non-trivial anomaly around the cone points. And this, will, of course, will have uh, consequences. So the, what, 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 what is it known about uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, systems? Well, my, the problem I'm interested in is ergodicity. Ergodicity. So there is, uh, of course, uh, the result of Kirchhoff Mesosmiley, which I think is 86. Uh, which says that there exists a G delta dense uh, set of polygons, uh, well, fix the number of edges, uh, and, and then there is a G, del G delta dense set of polygons uh, which are ergodic. And the proof here is uh, essentially an application of their result for rational polygons, so they, they were able to prove that the, the flow of a rational polygon, in the rational case, of course, we know that the, the angle is essentially an invariant of motion, and so the, the, float, the, 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 uh, the, the geodesic flow takes place in on invariant surfaces, which are surfaces of a certain genus, and the, the theorem there says that on almost all invariant surfaces, the flow is uniquely ergodic. So as an application by fast approximation method, they can get this result. So essentially here we have uh, uh, from, from unique ergodicity in the rational case, in the rational case uh, by fast approximation, roughly. What I want to stress here is fast approximation. Uh, that, that this is the main idea of the, of the I mean, it's not the core of the, the core of the theorem is really a rational case, and then there's a fast approximation map. And then uh, there is also a result by Ivor Roberts, uh, I think 97. Uh, it's an effect, effective version, effective version. Basically, the result says that uh, if the angles, if the angles uh, of the of the of the table are irrational and extremely well approximable are extremely well approximated 
by rationals in a certain way, let me not be, this implies uh, ergodicity. Um, besides that, I no, I'm not sure there are many results about ergodicity. I don't, I don't know of any, actually. Um, there, 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 is, there are questions, of course. So the, the, the one famous question is whether, is whether uh, the billiard in a right triangle, uh, which is sort of a, with, so that's isomorphic to a system of two masses, uh, colliding elastically. This is a well-known uh, example. And uh, here the angle is inverse tangent of the square root of the ratio of the masses. So motivated by this Hamiltonian system of two masses colliding elastically among each other and with the endpoints of an interval, uh, which system which is isomorphic to a, essentially to a billiard in a, in a right triangle, there was a question whether uh, this would be ergodic for almost all choices of uh, of the, of the one parameter. There is one angle to choose. And uh, so the question is almost all uh, choices, almost all parameter values, uh, par parameter values uh, imply ergodicity. OK, so let me say at the outset that this is, this is a really delicate and it's definitely far from uh, the scope of what, whatever I can ever do. And uh, it, it's interesting to, to look at numerical studies. I mean, th there are numerical studies by several group of people, uh, many Italians. And numerical studies uh, claim, claim something like acute, acute, acute uh, triangles, uh, no rational acute triangles. We are we mixing? Uh, I'm sorry, are mixing even. And, uh, and at first, uh, right triangles, always no rational. So maybe I, I won't repeat all the time, no rational. I'm assuming that they are, actually, in fact, I'm assuming that they are as irrational as they can be in the sense that there is only the trivial relation. So when, 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 when we have a right triangle, this is a rank one situation. We have only one irrational, free irrational. And when, I, when we look at acute triangles, we have a rank two situation. We have two free uh, irrationals. I never consider the case when there are relations. Just a, so in the right triangle case, the right triangle case, uh, there is a first uh, claim um, in the 90s that this would be weak mixing. And there is a uh, recent, so this is old, and there is a, there is a recent claim which is which says that actually these are non-ergodic. Huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, well, it's, it's, you know, different times. So, which is true, I have no idea, but it's, I think it's, uh, you know, interesting to see that the numerics is, uh, is I, I don't understand the numerics, but it's, it's pretty delicate to, the, to decide, even numerically, what, what, what the truth is. Okay, so, um, You have a question? Or? Sorry. So, um, OK, so how to approach this problem? Well, uh, to me, the, what I'm trying to do is uh, uh, broader than just, uh, than just uh, this case. Um, so the, the general picture, so let me just say a couple of words about the general picture. The general picture is that uh, in, 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 in parabolic dynamics, dynamics of systems which are not hyperbolic and not, maybe not quite periodic, so intermediate dynamics, there are several cases of systems which are renormalizable and similar systems which are not renormalizable and there is, a, there is a big gap between what, what people can do in one case and what people can do in the other case. So for instance, so just to, to give a, of course when I say not renormalizable, I don't want to say that uh, I know that there is no renormalization. It's more as, as a, a statement of ignorance. Uh, so far, nobody has produced a renormalization scheme that, that works, that, that can be applied and, and produce results, as far as I know. And I, I may be wrong on some cases. So here is, I will put non-renormalizable. And the examples 
Here are, for instance, well, for, of course, uh, there is the translation surface, translation surface versus, well, uh, flat, general flat surface, say no rational, just to simplify, again, no rational flat surface. And so these are, in some sense, similar words, but here we have a wonderful uh, tool, wonderful theory, actually, uh, related to Tachymuller flow, or the induction, and everything, which essentially is a normalization procedure that allows us to obtain a lot of information and results about what's going on for the, for the dynamics on the surface, even on the individual surface, uh, given recent progress. In this case, there is nothing comparable. So there are other cases that I find interesting. There is, for instance, the case of vile sums. Vile sums uh, for uh, quadratic polynomials. Uh, they correspond to flows, flows on uh, roughly on step two or Eisenberg, Eisenberg, um, nilpotent uh, nil manifolds. And on this side, you have uh, weil sums, weil sums for higher degree polynomials, for higher degree. And well, they correspond. Well, they can be they can be studied by by nil flows on higher step. And uh, well, the difference again here is that well, it's known basically since Hardy and Littlewood in, in 1914 that the quadratic case has a as a as a, a self similarity, so it, ca it can be sort of renormalized. While as far as I know, again, there is no known way of uh, attacking. Uh, the vile sums, so, uh, vile sums are uh, sums of the form, so maybe I should say this, vile sums are sums of the form uh, x uh, 2 pi i p uh, p k or p d p d n uh, n from 0 say to n minus 1 and one is interested in growth, growth bounds. And there are many results, uh, uh, even in this case. I think the, the best results in the step case uh, are due to Trevor Woolley, which uses uh, analytic number theory methods. So they're, it's not, they're not dynamical, as far as I, as I can see. And um, so here is d equal to 2, and here is d uh, larger than 2. So there are other cases uh, of this kind. For instance, there is the. Um, so here I continue renormalizable versus non renormalizable. And uh, here there is, for instance, the case of uh, SL2R unipotence, the oral cycle flows. Well, they are, of course, renormalized. They are renormalized, renormalized by geodesic flow. And here you can con consider uh, unipotent, unipotence in, say, for instance, SL2R, uh, cr cross SL2R, of course, acting on some quotient, acting on, say, compact quotient or finite, uh, finite volume quotient. So this is easily normalized. There are a lot of papers, including a paper I wrote with Vivio Faminio about uh, speed. In this case, the question is more the speed of equidistribution than just uh, ergodicity. The unique ergodicity is known, it's quite classical. In this case, one, one is more interested in, in effective, effective results. So in all these cases, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, one is really interested, they are homogeneous, and the one is really, really interested in effective uh, results rather than just uh, ergodicity results. So, So there are all these cases where one, one has a system which is normalizable and then a similar system which is not really normalizable. So what, I, what I've been trying to do is basically to, uh, to take the point of view that uh, uh, when there is no self similarity, maybe the, uh, one can still uh, 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 get result by uh, simply uh, giving up some, some part of renormalization idea, which is essentially that there is a rescaling of the system uh, followed by a change of coordinates. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, the idea is that there will be no change of coordinate, 
they will only be uh, rescaling. So these are rescaling, rescaling methods, rescaling approach. So to, to, I guess to make this a little bit more understandable, I'm not going to talk about the other, the other cases. Any questions? Okay. I'm not going to talk about the other case. I'm going to just come back to what? <laughs> I'm going to come back to to the case of uh, translation surfaces and uh, and uh, um, and uh, flat surfaces. So for translation surfaces, let me give you a caricature. For transistor surfaces, um, there is, of course, Mazur criterion. Mazur's criterion. So I could simply say that, since uh, here everybody knows Mazur's criterion, I guess, I could simply say that what I'm trying to do is to extend Mazur's criterion to, to, uh, to flat surfaces, uh, non-translation to flat surfaces. So uh, the attempt is, uh, well, this attempt is successful I have a Mesos criterion for, for flat surfaces. The question is whether the Mesos criterion, you see there is a Mesos criterion, and then there is a proof that actually by the Mesos criterion you can get a full measure set of systems or almost all directions in a polygon and so on. So there is Mesos criterion plus, well, the non-trivial, uh, obviously non-trivial part of applying it. So here is the part where I'm essentially, well, stuck is probably not the right word, but m maybe it is in some sense. So it's a slow, a slowly moving, very, very slowly moving. So the measure criteria is OK, and, I, and that's what I'm going to explain today. Uh, I mean, uh, at least in, uh, I mean, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some ideas and the statement, of course. So, so the measure criteria, uh, let me interpret it in the following way. So I, I want to think of a metric. In this case, we have a flat metric on a translation surface. So a flat metric on a translation surface is given by two vector fields. So it's given by y2. Usually one, well, we can do rotation, but one is enough. But I prefer to look at both of them. So there will be an horizontal vector field and a vertical vector field that I will call x and y. Uh, they have a nice, uh, there is a nice list structure, which is, of course, obvious. They just, they just infinitesimally commute. Of course, there are cone points, but away from cone points, so here is a cone point, but away from cone points, um, uh, they commute. And uh, so it, the local structure here is really abelian, is R2. And it's quite natural to try to, to deform a metric, a metric given by a, pair, by a commuting pair by an automorphism of, of R2, a linear map, which also preserve, uh, preserves the uh, uh, the area, say, so it's so the deformation is going to be x t equal to e t x and y t equal to e to the minus t y, and uh, uh, this will def and in general R t uh, of, of, of x y say, but I, w I will sometimes drop x y is just the metric the metric making this is just a way of expressing things, making uh, x and y orthonormal. All right, so Mesoch theorem basically says the following. It says that if this metric is not degenerating too much, too fast, or not at all, I mean, not at all, it's an extreme case, but if the metric is not degenerating too much, then, we, then the x flow is uniquely ergodic. So, so RT. Uh, not, not escaping to infinity, well, in some sense, which in this case is precise, implies the flow of x, flow of x, uh, uniquely ergodic. So in fact, um, if flow of x is not uniquely ergodic, then, uh, then uh, uh, RT escapes to infinity moduli space, but uh, for 
What I want to stress here, yeah, I don't want to have a moduli space. I don't have a moduli space. So, so I, I want to forget about the moduli space. So what I'm going to say is that, well, uh, simply the fact is that uh, I look at the Sisto function, uh, the Sisto function, uh, delta, uh, delta of t equal to delta of rt. And uh, if this uh, goes to 0, goes to 0, Sufficiently, in fact, sufficiently slowly, uh, slowly, uh, this uh, implies uh, unique ergodicity. So yeah, I'm, I'm uh, so in fact, in fact, uh, in Mesor criterion, basically what you need is that this, the system uh, becomes larger than some, some small number uh, every so often, so to speak. Or so, or a result of this kind. There is a, there is a more, there are more precise results. Uh, the first one is, uh, is just to, just to mention that, uh, work in this direction. There is a paper by Chung asking, uh, slightly improved or improved a bit by my student uh, Rodrigo Trevino, that basically make this a bit more quantitative. And uh, the result of Trevino, in particular, says that if the integral of the square, of the system is infinite then, uh, then uh, the flow of x is unique ergodic. Now, I, I, I think that there is, one can do better. In fact, uh, uh, Rodrigo and John Schaik have probably, uh, they told me that they have a result where they can do better. And they can, in fact, prove that uh, Mesur log law implies unique ergodicity, which is, I think, uh, nice. But I, you get the picture. The picture that there is a, there is a function, there is a function that measures the geometry, which is the systol, and if the function is not going to, to zero, to, in this case, not, is not going to zero too fast, then we get unique ergodicity. Then there is a separate problem of actually proving that if we pick a random direction on a, fl on a translation surface, uh, almost all directions, we, we, will, we will be able to verify the assumption of the criterion. And this is exactly what, for instance, is done in kirchhoff mesur smiley for the random direction. For the random direction, they are able to apply uh, Mesos criterion, uh, well, essentially. So, so, so that this is the part of the criterion, the part of the application. Now, what is the criterion for that I have for for um, for flat surfaces which are not translation? Well, I mean, uh, the, the criterion actually also also for for translation for the translation case. So, let me get. Okay, so first of all, I have to tell you what is the, what is the scaling. So there is, a, there is a scaling to be chosen. And uh, in some sense, whenever the local least structure um, has appropriate automorphisms, like in the R2 case, well, there is an easy guess. This doesn't mean that the easy guess is going to work, and there's a lot of work to make it work, but, but there is a sort of an easy guess. Uh, so there is an easy guess in the Eisenberg case that we exploited uh, to, to re with Flaminio to revisit uh, the theory of uh, quadratic vial sums. There is no easy guess in the translation surface case because what is the stru local structure of a flat surface? So we have M. Recall, I recall that M is the unit tangent bundle of a surface. And the, the, the structure is the following. There is a vector field X, which is the generator of the flow we want to study. This is the geodesic flow. There is a vector, a vector field y, which is the perpendicular geodesic flow. Well, this is a convenient base, of course. Uh, um, the perpendicular geodesic flow is the flow that one obtains by uh, turning by pi over 2, flowing time t, and then turning um, pi over 2 in the opposite direction. And there is also a, a, a generator of the rotation in the fiber, generator of a uh, rotation uh, rota rotation in the fiber. Well, because of course this space is a circle, uh, circle bundle over S. Well, away from from the cone point. So let me just uh, put a star to say that I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk about the cone points. In some sense, they are at the boundary. So there, there is this uh, this frame, and uh, this frame satisfies the following the following uh, commutation relations. So x and y is, is still 0. And uh, theta x is y. 
and uh, theta y is minus x. This is just uh, basically uh, ordinary surface surface uh, Riemannian geometry, and uh, the this is a solvable group and doesn't have a proper automorphism. So there's, there's, there's no way of scaling this, this metric by an automorphism of the Lie group. Uh, so there's no way in particular of preserving the commutators. So, so, so this idea that we may have recurrence in our scaling is lost by the very nature of the algebra of, of, the, of, the, of the local structure. So, okay, what is the scaling? Now, the scaling doesn't come from, from uh, a guess. Although I can, I can say a few words about why, in some sense, a posteriori uh, may seem to be natural, uh, but you know, this is just essentially uh, a, heuristic, a posteriori heuristic, so it doesn't, doesn't hold much, much weight. So the scaling is the following. So I will, I will consider, no, I will call the parameter S from now on, not T, because it's not time. There is no, there is no tachymular dynamics. Unfortunately, uh, if I could do it with the dynamics, I would do it, but I don't see any dynamics. So it's a really a scaling parameter, so we are going to scale the metric in the following way. And this is uh, the metric which uh, uh, is a metric, uh, is a metric such that, uh, such that the following, so x is scaled uh, X and Y are, are scaled exactly as in Tachmuller case. This in particular means that if you do this forgetting about theta, you recover, you recover a good theory of a, of a Mesor criterion for translation surfaces, which in particular can give a Trevino's result uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you work on it. And uh, uh, so it's in some sense, uh, this is uh, just an extent, there's an extension to I'm sorry, I should put xs, uh, ys, and theta s. And here is e to the minus 2s theta. OK, so this is, the, this is the scaling. And as I said, the scaling comes out of the proof. So the proof of the criterion gives this scaling uh, as, the, as, the, as the best uh, doable, as the best doable with the best I can do. Now, in what sense there is some uh, reason to think that this may be natural? Well, uh, the way I think of this is uh, may, may, may be stupid. Uh, so if you think it's stupid, you can just tell me. So the way I think of this is that uh, if you look at schoen gaskin proof, uh, in some sense the main point is that when, when you have a renormalization uh, in Takimura case, we'll tell you that if you, uh, if you look in, uh, in the phase space, you will see often um, orbit segments of length capital T surrounded by in, in rectangles of approximately size 1 over T. And these rectangles are such that all the orbits go together. So you have bundles of orbits that go together um, uh, at, this, at this scale. So this, the time scale is T, capital T, and uh, the transverse scale is 1 over T. So if you do this, if you do this uh, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in, in the flat surface case, you are now in a three-dimensional manifold, and you have to deal with the fact that, uh, of course, if you change the angle by a little bit, you're going to change uh, the, the, the direction of your, of, your, of your trajectory. So in some sense, it's somewhat natural that uh, the, the scaling of the theta direction should be much weaker than than the scaling of the y direction. So yeah, it, it, the main point here is that the curvature of the scaling stays bounded. If I do, in fact, the commutators are not preserved, but they are bounded. And in fact, the commutator relationship of this of this sole manifold they go to an important manifold. In, in other terms, if I, if I do uh, if I do if I commute x and theta, which I which means I rotate by by some amount in theta and I flow along x. I'm not moving more than what y allows me to move. And this means that there are boxes in, in the three-dimensional space of orbits which essentially go follow the same story, roughly. So this is, uh, this is the, uh, in some sense, the heuristics. But uh, I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure this is meaningful heuristics. But as I said, it's not, it's not the motivation for the scaling. So now let me state the theorem. 
and uh, I will just write it down, and then I, I you know, it, it's, uh, it's not immediate to digest, so, so uh, I will add comments. So, so here are the hypotheses, so let me try to be clear what is an hypothesis. So I, I want to assume the following. So, so uh, I could ask for all, something for all parameters, but really the, the, the full statement is that the, the, I assume that there exists some set um, P. Um, this set has to have positive lower density. Which simply means, imagine, I don't have to control all the scalings. I only need to control scalings for sufficiently large set of parameters. Like you have an orbit that you don't, we, I don't have it here, but it's more or less the same thing as saying that if I had a renormalization, I, I, I only need to look at the return times or, it, or return to a compact set or something like this. So I need, uh, I need a set of positive lower density. So, so this is a subset of reals? That's a subset of reals, yes, a subset of reals. Thank you. And uh, S, the parameter S, is, little s, is going to belong to, to, this, to this set. And, and then um, uh, there should be also a small number, uh, some d naught positive, some small number. And uh, for, for any d, so now I choose s uh, for any s in p and little d less than d naught. I want to have an open set, so that there must exist an open set that will depend on s and on d, which has to uh, open connected. Um, also, just to make thing, things more precise, this set is uh, a way a way at uh, R S distance uh, d from the cone points. So this is also you have to require that. So you have to think of this as, as a, a in first approximation as a set that you obtain by throwing away d neighborhood of the cone points with respect to the RS metric. So this is the scale metric. And then there are two, the two main assumptions. So, so for these deformation values and for uh, all sufficiently small values of a parameter, we can find an open connected set away uh, from the cone points uh, such that the following things are true. S uh, say the uh, the Chigger constant, so Chigger constant, I will say what Chigger constant is, Chigger constant HS, well HRS of omega S D is uh, bigger than some constant that depends only on D, uh, let's say for all S, uh, for all S in P, so for this S that I control, which are real parameters, the Chigger constant uh, stays bounded below. And uh, second, here I could do a little better, but I don't think it's really uh, re relevant, essential. And second, uh, I need to have the, the limit when I take D to zero. Well, what I want to have is that the volume of this set is large. So as far as I can see, there is no no need to relax this to, you know, to be, say, larger than one half. And I may as well ask that the, the limit of the volume of this set uh, is one, but it has to be uniformly, it has to be uniform, uniform over S in P. So in other terms, you could say this simply by saying that the difference from the, between the volume of omega S and the full volume, uh, well, one, not one, because if I take the volume Rs, um, I should put here e to the 2s, right? So let me stick with the, with the metric Rs. The vol total volume of the metric Rs is e to the 2s. So it's uh, because the theta, theta direction is so small that the volume explodes exponentially. What do you want to do with this? Um, 
So that's the statement. So now I, uh, oh, I have to tell you what is the Chigger constant. So the Chigger constant here replaces, replaces the systole. In fact, if you are on a surface, the, the systole is a good, uh, a good proxy for the Chigger constant. Essentially, you can easily bound the Chigger constant by, a low, you can give a lower bound uh, using the systole for the Chigger constant. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so these are the assumptions, the conclusions, of course, that flow of x, which is geodesic flow, is ergodic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Yeah, I wrote the assumptions large because, of course, uh, there are a lot of them. And yes, no, okay. So, okay, Chigger constant. Chigger constant H R of omega is uh, let's see. It's uh, the infimum over sigma separating surface. surface here is in M uh, of the area R over the mean of the volume of the two, of the two pieces. So it's, uh, what do you call it, omega, omega prime sigma and uh, omega second sigma. And uh, omega is supposed to be omega minus sigma is supposed to be omega prime sigma union omega second sigma. So it, it, the set is separated by sigma. Omega is an open set. Omega open. So th this is the definition of the Chigger constant. And uh, well, now, unless there are, qu there are questions, what I'm trying to do, I'll try to explain why the Chigger constant comes up and uh, what, what I get. Of course, of course, uh, uh, I could, so this says that if you, if one is able to construct an open set with this property, with these properties, then, then uh, ergodicity will follow. Uh, that's what the theorem says. So the, the task is then in the application of the criterion. And of course, as you can see, the, the main difficulty here is that you have to check all separating surfaces, and uh, you have to do it by hand. So, I mean by hand. You have to classify them and, uh, and case by case uh, uh, prove that the ratio area to volume uh, is, be is bounded below. So, that's, so, so the, the problem with this proof is that, okay, you, you, do, you do a number of them and then you miss some case. So that's what I've been doing at, at first. Now I think I'm covering all the ground, but, but well, I'm, I'm not in a position of, of affirming that I can, I, can, I, can, I can really cover all the ground right now. So it's, but just to say that there is more, what I can do is goes beyond this simply this theorem. There, there's also a lot of uh, partial results towards uh, showing that the Chiller constant is indeed bounded below. So let's see, how much time do I have? Uh, here. Oops. 20 minutes, okay. Okay, so. So the main, the main point here is that, uh, so what are the tools to do something like this? So uh, the, these are kind of a, uh, analysis tools and exploit two facts. First of all, um, we have, a, we have a, a nice foliation in the, in the three-dimensional space. So, so we are in a 3D space. M is a, a 3D manifold. A finite volume.
And inside them, there is what is called the Olonomi foliation. Maybe uh, H or something like this. And this foliation can be described in several ways, but maybe the simplest one is that the foliation tangent to, tangent to this distribution x, y, or given by, given by parallel transport of, uh, of uh, unit vectors. So, so maybe I will attempt a, a pathetic caricature of, a, of this foliation. One way of thinking about it, I don't know, there are maybe better ways, but the, na the naivest way to think about it is that let's, let's say that we have, a, we have a sphere, so S is a sphere with two cone points, uh, three cone points, which corresponds to a triangle. For instance, it, it would come from a triangle. And then, uh, so, so you have these spheres, and you can, you can cut, cut them along to uh, two edges, to two, two straight segments joining two cone points. And in this way, the complement is simply connected. So now I can arrange them in a Z2 lattice. Well, the picture is probably too, too large here, but. So this is a Z2 grid. And then. Uh, I, you can think of these segments as, as, uh, as being doors. So this is a leaf of the foliation. Of course, it's just one leaf. By the way, uh, I should mention that uh, the leaf of this foliation uh, are what is what I call, lo uh, it's been proved by Ferran Valdez that they are Loch Ness monsters, meaning that uh, well, this picture, I'm sorry, this picture is in the case where the, the, is in the rank two case, rank two. Otherwise, it wouldn't be like this. So a Loch Ness, mo a Loch Ness monster uh, means that it's an infinite genus surface with just a single end. And uh, the way, so it's a Z2 grid of this. And you can put here, say, um, for instance, here we go up. If you cross on this side, you go up. So you go to the sphere here. If you cross on this side, you go down. And similarly here, up, down. And here you might go right. And here you might go left. and. Uh, and similarly here, and so on. So in every, in every sphere, I put one door, one side of the door brings you down, and the other side of the door brings you up. And uh, on the other segment, one side of the door brings you right, uh, and the other side brings you left. And then you can travel uh, in the Z2 grid in this way. So this is the caricature of, uh, of uh, one leaf, one leaf, a leaf of H. OK, now I have a challenging task of getting the, what is the right one? Yes. So there is this foliation. This foliation has a translation surface. Uh, of course, it's non-compact. And uh, the main point is that uh, it has a nice, it of course, obviously, as a translation surface, as a complex structure. And one can talk about uh, uh, um, holomorphic functions, foliated holomorphic functions. Yes? You have not applied uh, your uh, change of coordinates. No, this is just a topological, uh, just a topological picture, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, so if you want, it's a geometric picture. But, uh, but yeah, in the, in, the, in the original geometry. Yeah, this is uh, also a remark that as soon as I, as soon as I uh, distort the geometry, uh, the distorted geometry doesn't come from a flat surface anymore. So it's some metric on the three-dimensional space, but it's not a metric coming from a flat metric on the sphere anymore. And this expresses the fact that the commutation relations are, are, are broken by, by the deformation. So, 
So I want to work with uh, uh, the space H. Maybe H is a bad. Uh, so this is subspace of L2, of L2 of the phase space, is the space of uh, foliated, of L2 foliated holomorphic, holomorphic functions. And this is a useful space to, to look at. In particular, it's useful, so the proof will go like this. So uh, uh, a scheme, the scheme of the proof is not very surprising. So uh, the scheme will try to show that uh, if, if u is a, is a u in L2m uh, is an L2, uh, I'm sorry, is an invariant function, is a, an x invariant geodesic flow invariant function uh, the, uh, of zero average, uh, then u is zero. So that's the scheme of the proof. So it's not surprising. So we start with, a, with, a, with an L2 invariant function, and we try to get uh, some uh, Essentially, it's a smoothing procedure. So it's, it's a smoothing procedure. You can view it as a smoothing procedure, uh, which, which uh, gives approximations, uh, well, a family of approximations of you uh, by smooth functions with with control, control on, on derivatives, on scale derivatives. So I will try to make this, I mean, I will make this more precise in a moment. I'm just trying to indicate uh, how this is going to go. So, So the first step is to is to project to consider the orthogonal projection of uh, of, uh, of of u of the invariant function on the space of uh, holomorphic functions. So so there is a projection. So how much time do I have now? Oh, twelve minutes. Okay. So. So there is u, and uh, u gives a, um, a function little hs, which is the orthogonal projection, orthogonal projection of u onto uh, hs, which is the space, <coughs> the space of uh, holomorphic, holomorphic, uh, or foliated, or foliated. Uh, holomorphic, holomorphic functions. Foliated means that they are only holomorphic where they can be holomorphic. It means it means it's holomorphic on the leaves of the of the Ollone foliation because it's it's a three space, right? So. But in this three space, there are all these leaves, which are trans infinite, I mean, non-compact translation surfaces. And all those, uh, of course, you can talk about holomorphic. And in fact, let me pre make precise what is HS. HS is the, is the kernel of the, the form Cauchy-Riemann operator. So uh, HS is just uh, the kernel of e, to, uh, of e to the s x plus i e to the minus s y. So this is basically the definition. It's the L2 kernel of, uh, of this space, which is a deformed. So, so far, you can do this on a translational surface. Fine, you do it, and it works. So there is this, this space of the uh, deformed, of, of foliated or morphic function for the deformed metric. And, uh, and I want to project u on, on this space. Of course, I get a function which depends on the parameter s. And, uh, and then there are some calculations, and these calculations show the following. So there is a theorem or lemma, maybe proposition. <laughs> okay. 
So, so this, says, this says the following. The proposition says that, first of all, the imaginary part of HS goes to 0 uh, in L2. And the real part of HS goes to U in L2. Well, that's I'm cheating a little bit uh, here. I, uh, here is where uh, some, some set, some choice of parameters is, is needed. This is for S along, along a set of uh, full upper density. I mean, there, there are many S's for which, for which this takes place. And uh, so we are approximating here the L2 function, which is supposed to be invariant, of course. Uh, it, it, it doesn't exist, but I mean, I mean, no, it can exist. It can exist, because I'm not assuming anything here. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a flat surface. And, uh, and the real part uh, will converge to U. Uh, well, there are some cheat uh, also because, of course, the HS could be zero. Uh, it, it, there is a separate part of the proof that shows that if HS is zero, then U is zero. So it can be an invariant function for the geodesic flow ca cannot have a zero projection without being zero itself, uh, which is not obvious, of course, but not hard. And uh, and then, so so far so good. Then the next step is uh, application of a uh, Cauchy-Riemann equation, and the, the idea is simply the fact that um, you see the real part goes to u, but the imaginary part goes to zero and l2, and one can estimate the gradient of well the gradient s, the the the, the foliated gradient. So let me call d s the foliated gradient. Uh, with respect to uh, x, well, xs and ys. So here uh, we are really working like we were on a flat surface. The only difference is that we have a, we have a final volume. So it's a mixture of, uh, it's a foliated version of, uh, of uh, what we do in, uh, what we can do on, uh, on a translation surface. So the Fourier gradient, of course, can be estimated by Cauchy estimates in terms of the L2 norm um, of the imaginary part, which goes to zero, so it goes to zero. But the gradient of the imaginary part is the same as the gradient of the real part. So one gets the following uh, Cauchy, Cauchy estimate, roughly is the following. The, the gradient S of the real part of HS and here I should put L2, but let me put D away, D away from cone points. Uh, this is bounded by something like constant over D, and then the norm of the imaginary part of HS in L2, and so it goes to zero. And it, it goes, uh, yeah, it goes to zero. Uh, in some way that can be slightly estimated, but not really, not really um, uh, in a very effective way. So, so the, all this is sufficient to to get uh, to get ergodicity, unique ergodicity. Well, to get ergodicity first for for translation surfaces. So, uh, so far we are not dealing with a with a, with a theta direction. So, I won't say a lot about the theta direction, but Something yes, so especially if I have still something like five minutes, or maybe less. No, I have five minutes. Okay, so any questions? So I, I completely, I said nothing about how you get that the imaginary part of HS goes to zero and the real part of HS goes to U. This is in fact the same argument that proves the spectral gap of the conservative zodiacal cycle. So you just take the argument and use it here. So it's an Hodge, Hodge theory kind of uh, argument. Of course, the, there is no cohomology, but, but, but in, in essence, it's the same argument dealing with projections. So you, you can associate, in fact, homology classes to, to this object, but it doesn't seem to be very useful. But essentially, the, the underlying idea is to compute variational formulas, and use these variational formulas in, in, in a quite elementary way to get, to get 
uh, this proposition. So it's, it's rather elementary. And uh, its antecedent is exactly the Hodge theory proof of, uh, of the spectral gap for the k zico cycle. So OK, so, so now I want to, I want to uh, add the theta direction. To add the theta direction, the crucial point is the following. Now I have um, uh, theta uh, is a generator is a generator uh, of a circle action, circle action. So there is a, there is a decomposition, L2 decomposes as direct sum over L2 of M, decomposes as a direct sum of spaces En, which are uh, theta eigenspaces. So there are theta eigenspaces. They are, they are infinite dimensional, but, uh, but still they, they, they are eigenspaces. And, um, and moreover, um, OK, let's see. Moreover, what? There are some commutation relations. So uh, the commutation relations, in fact, uh, th that I put uh, on the blackboard at the beginning, I guess they're not there anymore. The, co the basic commutation relation between x and y and theta imply that if we take the cauchy riemann operators, uh, uh, d plus, on sufficiently smooth function that belongs to En, they, they send En into, into En. Well, this is, I'm sorry, this is x plus iy. Let me just write x plus iy. And x minus iy uh, it sends En into En plus 1. So they are sort of creation destruction uh, operator for, for these stairs of En. And um, this is only true for the non-deformed uh, uh, cauchy riemann But still, it's, uh, it can be, it's an important relation that can be, you know, you get, get some knowledge out of it. And, uh, and now we have our approximate HS. And the idea is that to do a careful truncation to make it smooth in the theta direction. And this is really like, uh, the, the usual regularization process. So, so uh, smoothing, smoothing uh, in the theta direction uh, is done by somewhat careful, careful truncation. So careful means that you, you cannot just do anything. You just you try to locate the, the, the best place to truncate. Uh, careful truncation uh, of the, of the uh, theta uh, series uh, of, uh, of HS. So that's the first step. Now, if I do this, if I do just a truncation, I have a problem because I, I I lose the holomorphic nature of the function, and then I lose the cauchy riemann uh, inequalities. So this has to be followed, followed by a perturbation that one can control uh, that restore, restores the holomorphic property. So this, in, in, in words, is So that's the, ski, that's the idea of uh, how it goes. And now let me tell you what is the result of this. So of course you do this, uh, you have to do this quantitative. So you, you, smooth, you smooth in the theta direction as best as you can. And then you apply a perturbation which makes the function holomorphic again. And for that you have to use uh, the relation between uh, the cauchy riemann operators and the theta operator. And, uh, and uh, And then uh, this, the, the output of this is the following. So again, let's call it proposition. Uh, it says the following, that there exists uh, some h tilde s. It's not the hs uh, uh, that we had before. That uh, was real part such that 
uh, it's real part. So these are these are uh, uh, still in HS. So uh, foliated holomorphic, foliated holomorphic for uh, yeah, x s plus i y s. So and that's the probability that the real part of this function h shield h tilde still goes to u. So it's, uh, the whole thing is done in such a way that you, you don't want to destroy anything you have already. So this goes to u. Moreover, the gradient s of the real part of hs, that goes to u, uh, in L2 square. Again, here is L2 away, d away. When I say d away, is always in the s metric, in the, in the deform metric. Uh, d away from uh, cone points. So you remove a d neighbor of the cone points. And here, there is uh, this term, e to the minus 4s uh, theta. Or if you want, I could put theta s. But to make it completely clear, is e to the minus 4s uh, real part of hs square. And here is uh, L2, the whole L2. And uh, this sum converges to 0, roughly. I mean, there is a, there is a, play, a game with parameters, but essentially, this converges to 0 as s goes to infinity, and s belongs to uh, a set, s in a set uh, of full upper density. Full upper density. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you, you can think of s as going to infinity, and, and this expression as going to 0. So it converges to 0. Now this means that we have, a, we have approximated our L2 invariant function by a sequence of smooth functions whose gradient in a certain metric is going to zero. And the Chigar constant is exactly the, the, quantity, the geometric quantity that tells us that, uh, that uh, uh, if, if uh, uh, well, it tells us that uh, a function with these properties has, has to converge to a constant. And of course, since uh, the limit has to be uh, as to a zero average. This limit is going to be zero. So, so the idea is that what what does it take to to control the function if you control the gradient? Well, this is the f the bottom of the Laplacian. So the bottom of the Laplacian, in turn, is controlled by by the Chigar constant. That's why uh, this gives uh, the Chigar constant as a geometric uh, measure of the degeneracy of the, of this metric. So I guess I can stop here. And uh, of course, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. <laughs>